This video of a thylacine named Benjamin captures what I believe is one of the saddest moments in the history of conservation. It was taken in the Hobart Zoo in 1933. A few years later, this animal died of neglect after being left out in the cold. Hobart Zoo was expecting to find a replacement pretty soon after, and, well, they still haven't found one. In fact, outside of a few unreputable sightings, nobody has. The thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian wolf or Tasmanian tiger, was declared extinct in 1982 by the IUCN. It's a real shame that these animals no longer exist, as there's so much we could have learned from them. They really are incredible and interesting animals. For starters, their skulls are uncannily similar to modern wolves. According to Richard Dawkins, they're so similar that Oxford used them to trip up comparative zoology students on their final exams. Both have very sharp incisors and triangular premolars for shearing flesh, and large conical canines to effectively take down larger animals, huge jaw muscle attachments that allow for an incredibly strong bite force, a long snout for an enhanced sense of smell, and bulbous forward-facing eyes for stalking prey. The biggest difference between the two skulls happens to be a pair of holes in the hard palate of the thylacine. These holes hint at the thylacine's biggest secret. The Tasmanian wolf is far from a wolf. Thylacinus cynocephalus is actually a marsupial, being much more closely related to kangaroos and koalas than to dogs and dingoes. On the other side, dogs are much more closely related to whales than they are to thylacines. These placental pretenders appear all across the continent of Australia. It's hard to see a sugar glider and not be reminded of flying squirrels. Wombats are very similar to marmots, such as groundhogs, and despite being quite a bit smaller, Tasmanian devils share many morphological and behavioral characteristics with mustelids, like wolverines and honey badgers. Some pouch-bearing marsupials, such as marsupial mice and marsupial moles, appear so similar to their placental counterparts that they've even appropriated their names. In fact, the mole body plan has independently evolved at least three times. Other than marsupial moles, the golden moles from Africa and true moles are so morphologically similar that scientists believed them to be closely related until the late 1990s and early 2000s. More recently, studies have shown that golden moles belong to the superorder Afrotheria, making them more closely related to aardvarks and manatees, whereas the true moles are Laurasiotherians and are more closely related to giraffes and even humans. Ironically, marsupial moles, true moles, and golden moles are more closely related to thylacines, dogs, and elephants respectively than any of them are to each other, and their most recent common ancestors scurried under the feet of non-avian dinosaurs in the mid-Jurassic over 160 million years ago. All of these animals are striking examples of what is known as convergent evolution, where two distantly related and dissimilar animals evolve very similar body plans. Oftentimes, animals experience similar selective pressures across time and space, causing dissimilar animals to evolve in analogous ways to fill the same ecological niches. In the absence of carnivorans, the family of placental mammals containing dogs, cats, and bears, other fauna stranded on the isolated oceanic continent had evolved to fill predatorial niches, as in the case of the Tasmanian tiger. For millions of years, marsupials and giant reptiles ruled over Australia as apex predators. It's believed that the thylacine, along with nearly all of the other large predators of Australia, did not go extinct until it was outcompeted by humans and the remarkably similar dingo. The extraordinary similarity caused by cases of convergent evolution have led some to conclude that there is ultimately an ideal body plan for each niche, and animals will inevitably evolve towards said body plan, a concept sometimes known as evolutionary determinism. Determinists, such as Simon Conway Morris, believe that the change in allele frequency by natural selection is a highly directed process. This directly contradicts the idea of biological contingency, which argues that determinists are ignoring the other half of evolution, its reliance on random processes such as mutation. Spearheaded by the late Stephen Jay Gould, contingency argues that these chance events in Earth's past have a larger effect on today's biodiversity and diversity of body plans than even basic principles such as natural selection. In his book Wonderful Life, Gould argues, life is a copiously branching bush, continually pruned by the grim reaper of extinction, not a ladder of predictable progress. Naturally, this raises the question of who's right? Pitting some of the most fundamental forces of evolution against each other, and answering this question could completely change how we view the world. I believe that it provides context for some of the most hotly debated existential crises that humanity has to face. How special are we? How likely is intelligent life to evolve here or even outside of the Earth? 
Are we unique, or just an inevitable consequence of the forces of nature? The most fundamental idea of evolutionary determinism is that there are ideal solutions to specific ecological problems. This mentality is greatly expressed in Dale Russell's dinosauroid thought experiment. Stenonicosaurus inequalis, a troodontid of the late Cretaceous, and often referred to as troodon in popular media, has the largest encephalization quotient of any non-avian dinosaur. Despite being comparable to many of its closest modern relatives, the birds, and lower than most mammals, Stenonicosaurus would have likely been a fierce and highly intelligent small hunter for its time. Unfortunately, as with every other non-avian dinosaur of the late Cretaceous, Stenonicosaurus went extinct quickly after it appeared on the scene. Had Stenonicosaurus been allowed to continue evolving, Russell predicts that it may have ended up strikingly similar to modern humans. Russell argues that for the larger brain to develop, the dinosaur's head would need to move closer and closer to the center of mass. The posture would then become more erect, diminishing the need for a tail, and plantigrade feet would develop for better balance. The theropod's fingers would become more opposable as object manipulation and tool use became a stronger selection pressure. Then stereoscopic vision and binocular eyes would be needed so the eyes migrate to the center and become larger. The snout would be greatly reduced in size to accommodate for greater visibility and less reliance on bite force. The final result is essentially a race of lizardmen, very similar in appearance to the slee stacks of Land of the Lost. Other than the outdated lizardification of these dinosaurs, scientists have raised many concerns about the overly anthropomorphized figure of Russell's dinosauroid. Dr. Darren Nash describes the dinosauroid as disturbingly human-like. He doesn't believe that the dinosauroid would look so human due to a fundamental principle of phylogenetic taxonomy. You can't outgrow your ancestry. Nash makes an argument from contingency, stating that the reason we humans have the body shape that we do is not because it's the best body shape for a smart, big-brained biped to have. It is instead the result of our specific lineage's evolutionary history. Nash believes that instead of essentially evolving into hominids, dinosauroids would remain theropods, just highly derived. In the real world, this principle makes sense. While animals often do converge, this generalization misses many of the subtleties. Thylacines are marsupials, and like every other marsupial without fail, it has two holes in the roof of its mouth. If an animal doesn't need to change a morphological characteristic, it usually won't. A real dinosauroid would at least have a much more horizontal posture and digitigrade feet simply because these are ancestral traits that aren't necessary to lose. Intelligence has evolved independently multiple times, and it doesn't seem like there is an objectively best strategy for it. Even though this trait exists across taxonomic bounds, only humans have solved these problems by being bipedal omnivores with opposable thumbs. Other highly intelligent animals, such as dolphins, elephants, and parrots, have completely different methods for object manipulation and social behaviors, becoming intelligent while keeping ancestral traits. On the other hand, contingency doesn't necessarily explain how common the phenomenon of convergent evolution is. In nature, it occurs all the time all around the world. There are sea slugs that look and swim like fish, and convergence on the crab body plan is so common that it even has a fancy name, carcinization. My favorite example is the convergence between the living two-toed and three-toed sloths. They're visually and behaviorally very similar. They even use the same mode of locomotion but they evolved suspension completely independently. Their lineages diverged over 20 million years ago, and the three-toed sloths are actually much more closely related to the most iconic giant ground sloths like Megatherium. This phenomenon has been shown to occur in controlled experiments as well. Through his work on the genus Anolis in the Caribbean, Professor Jonathan B. Lossus has shown that evolution is actually quite repeatable. Scientists have long known that Anoles occupied similar ecological roles on many different islands, but Lossus discovered that the Anoles were more closely related to those that shared the island than those that shared the niches. On each island, they usually radiated from a singular common ancestor through a process known as niche partitioning. Interestingly, they often radiated into the same niches, but even more interestingly, the species that shared niches also shared similar morphological characteristics. Lizards that lived primarily on the ground had longer legs, whereas lizards that lived on trunks and walls had shorter legs. To test how reproducible this process is, Lossus introduced lizards to many small islands. Then he introduced a natural predator, the curly-tailed lizard, to some. Within six months, all populations exposed to predation had begun evolving longer legs as there was an initial selection pressure for running faster. Very soon after, all the populations experienced a sharp turnaround and began evolving shorter legs as they adapted to a more arboreal lifestyle.
None of these islands had any genetic admixture, but they all converged on the same strategies. Personally, I believe that the extent of convergence depends heavily on a number of factors and cannot be prescribed as entirely deterministic or contingent. Convergence is often heavily reliant on how closely the animals are related. As Professor Lossus showed, when you take the same population and subject them to the same pressures, they'll respond in the same way, even without any gene flow. But replacing the anoles on some island with geckos would likely result in different survival strategies. In this way, the convergence is predicted by determinism, but the differences caused by evolutionary distance is predicted by contingency. We can look to mass extinctions as a demonstration of this principle. For example, the KPG extinction wiped out all non-avian dinosaurs, leaving many niches open. And those same niches were filled by the new Cenozoic mammal-dominated biota. You still have large herding grazers and large predators to eat them. But the bipedality seen in extinct theropods is gone from the dominant predators of today, such as the carnivorans. This principle has also been demonstrated in a lab. As you by now have probably guessed, the long-term evolutionary experiment is one of my favorite experiments, and has greatly increased our understanding of the mechanisms that affect life on our planet. As I stated in the last video, these E. coli initially converged on a high number of traits. All 12 populations grew faster, increased average cell size, and decreased population density. Then, one of the cultures had a drastic population increase due to its ability to ferment citrate despite aerobic conditions, around generation 31,500. Not only was this ability specific to this individual line, but it was even contingent on the distance from the final mutation. Using cells frozen from that line at previous times, Dr. Zachary Blount discovered that no cells from before the 15,000th generation could evolve to metabolize citrate. But, starting from generation 20,000, the chance to gain this ability increased as the generation sampled got closer to the generation 31,500. His team deduced that the ability to metabolize citrate was contingent on many preceding random mutations, and as the sample grew closer to the 31,500th generation, the cells contained more of these necessary mutations, making it more likely for the sit-positive phenotype to arise. Therefore, the more similar the cells already were, the more likely they were to arrive at the same adaptation. Also, while convergence does occur, it's rarely ever as drastic as a dinosauroid. Convergence itself is highly dependent on definitions. Wings, for instance, have independently evolved in many different lineages, such as birds, pterosaurs, bats, and insects. In pterosaurs, wings were formed by skin attached to an extremely long fourth finger. In birds, wings were formed by feathers attached to a fusion of many wrist bones known as the carpometacarpus and phalanges, as well as their ulna. In bats, wings are highly modified webbed hands, and in insects, wings are so highly derived that we have no clue what their basal structure is homologous to. They're all definitely analogous, but to what extent are these convergent? They've evolved from many different organs in response to different pressures, but have achieved the same result. While dinosauroids will never exist, it does bring up the probability of intelligence and advanced civilization evolving in other species. Determinists would argue that sentience is an inevitable outcome of evolution, as it's statistically very likely that a niche occurs where intelligence and social development is highly beneficial. Subscribers of contingency would counter this by stating how single cellular life was perfectly happy for nearly 3 billion years, even though multicellularity doesn't seem particularly difficult to evolve, arising many different times independently. I think that, in a nearly infinite universe, the chance of intelligent life evolving at at least one other time is nearly infinitely high. But these life forms would likely be extremely different, probably convergent only in intellect. Like most things, convergence exists on a spectrum, highly dependent on pre-existing similarities and how far you're willing to stretch your definition. Okay, once again, the, the video is pretty much over and it's time for my, my post-video ramblings. You can go now if you want, but I have some pretty sick shoutouts to make. Um, first of all, this video was primarily inspired by a set of three books called Crucible of Creation, Wonderful Life, and Improbable Destinies by Simon Conway Morris, Stephen Jay Gould, and Jonathan Lossus, respectively. I mostly wanted to say, if you want to explore this debate further, I definitely recommend Professor Lossus' book, um, as it goes into way more detail than I could ever hope. All three of these books are great reads, don't get me wrong. Um, I would definitely recommend all of them. But I mostly want to shout out Professor Lossus because um, I've had the pleasure of meeting him and getting to know him, and I think he's a great guy. So, And also his book's really interesting. It gets an A-plus in my book. Um, 
secondly, I would really like to shout out Dapper Dino. Um, he he made a, a little Twitter post. Well, I mean, probably everyone watching this is from that Twitter post um, that made my video go from like eight views to over 30 views. And yeah, that doesn't seem like a lot. That's fair. But you know, the eight views were primarily bot accounts and me on a couple of alts just to make sure everything was working. Um, so, you know, it's essentially an infinitely high increase if you're going by percent because you can't divide by zero. Um, and not only that, I think it exposed me to the right audience. You know, my, my goal for this is to entertain people or inform people. And if one person learned something, I consider it, you know, it was worth it. And I, I did a good job. And so I think the audience entrusted to me was the right audience for that, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all I can think of. Um, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.